everybody welcome back to my channel my name is Megan and today I'm doing the love dare marriage day or marriage 40 day challenge and um, usually I do like one or I do three days in a video but I come back throughout the days that I do it but I'm kind of behind on my recording but I have caught up on my reading so I'm just gonna do like all three days today um, and which really doesn't matter to you but that's why I'm not changing clothes but anyway um, this is day 34 35 and 36 and this one I'm doing right now is day 34 and that is love celebrates godliness and it says love does not rejoice in unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth and that's 1st Corinthians 13 6 the closer you and your spouse are to God, the more loving you will be in marriage. That's John 13, 34 through 35. And I really like that, so I'm going to repeat it. It is, the closer you are to your spouse, are to God. Wait, the closer you and your spouse are to God, the more loving you will be in marriage. John 13, 34 through 35. Our roles as husband and wife are greatly enhanced by becoming growing Christians. People who don't rely on God are significantly limited, left to depend on their own changing feelings, selfish thinkings, and human efforts. And I wrote, I often wonder how people without believing in God survive, especially during the hard times. When I'm stressed or have anxiety or just going through something hard, I always turn to God. And I don't see how people who are, have all that and aren't Christians are able to get through life. A lot, a lot of them don't, but that's something that I've thought about. Um, but with him, we have daily access to his toolbox for marriage. His word nourishes us spiritually and equips us. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 his counsel guides our thoughts and decisions with wisdom. James 1, 5. His Holy Spirit works to improve our attitudes and mature us from the inside out. That's Galatians 5, 22 through 25. Every act of hatred, every subtle deception, and every plot of unfaithfulness is vetoed by His love. But on those days when we, even as believers, refuse to pray for prayerfully depend upon him walk in his love or obey his commands we can become spiritually dry pride and selfishness can begin to take over anger impatience and thoughtfulness can become our default then our spouses and families are deal left to deal with the fallout Walking in fellowship with God is better than a thousand marriage books or counseling sessions, as helpful as these resources can be. Hi. <laughs> oh, we didn't comb your hair before we did this. Nope, we did it. No. <laughs> it's like this. Say hi. Hi. Okay. Oh, we got that. We got that. We got that. We got that out. Mm -hmm. We did. Okay, let's see. Men who are walking closely with God each day won't deceive or degrade their wives. When God is guiding a woman's mouth, she will encourage her family instead of complaining or tearing them down. Simply put, one of the greatest priorities for your marriage should be a daily, daily cultivating your relationship with God while celebrating any spiritual growth in your spouse. What makes you the proudest of your husband? What overjoys you the most in your life? Is it when he wins at golf or finds a great deal at the mall? Or are you most impressed when he gathers the family to pray and read the word before bed? Or when she forgives the neighbor whose dog dug up some of her plants? You are one of the most influential people in your spouse's life. They will want to please whoever praises them the most. Have you been using your influence to lead them to honor God? And I said that one of the proudest of David would be his hard work and his love for me and the kids. Okay, shh. 
There's a keyboard here, and he's counting all the numbers. <laughs> Sorry. And he's four, um, five, love six, rejoices six, most seven, in the eight, things that please eight, God. Eight, nine, when your mate is growing a Christian character, eight, preserving in faith, eight, seek eight, purity, and embracing roles roles of giving and service, become spiritually active in your home. The Bible says you should be celebrating it. More than when they save money on the grocery bill. More than when they achieve success at work. Okay, shh, James. It should be romantic for a woman to see her strong husband humbling himself before God. It should be inspiring for a man to see his wife living with deep spiritual conviction and passion. You should rejoice and be absolutely thrilled, excitedly cheering them on for what they're allowing God to accomplish in their lives. The Apostle Paul often wrote in his letters how delighted he was to hear reports of people's faithfulness and growth in Jesus. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as if only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each other of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God. And that's 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 through 4. Sometimes, by accepting modern cultures take on what to applaud in your spouse who can actually be guilty of encouraging them to sin, perhaps by feeding their vanity or by letting boys be boys. So I'll be back. You'll be back. Okay. But love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, not in ourselves and not in our mate. Rather, love rejoices with the truth, the way the Apostle John did when he said, I have no greater joy than this to hear my family walking in the truth. That's Third John 4. He knew that the pursuit of godliness, purity, and faithfulness remaining unjaded and uncompromising in life was the only way for them to please God, complete their purpose, and find joy and fulfillment in life. But what if your spouse is not a believer? How can you champion, champion godly behavior in them if they, do, if they don't believe in God and refuse to submit, submit to Him? Paul told believing spouses to stay true to their unbelieving mates, pray for them, and live an exemplary life before them in reverence to God. That's 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 16. Yes, this may invite ridicule in some marriages, but when Christ takes over a man's heart, the long-term life change and spiritual transformation of God develops in him is a powerful testimony that is hard for his wife to deny. Please be quiet, baby. Mm -hmm. Scripture exhorts wives and to quietly use like their it. submission, purity, and respectful behavior to win over their husbands. I'm I love that. I'm going to say uh, that again. I'm going to walk that. I'm going to walk on that. I'm going to walk on it. Okay. Scriptures exhorts that, wives that, uh, to quietly like use their submissions, oh purity, God, and respectful behavior yeah, to win over I'm their husbands. First Peter like 3, 1 through 2. Sometimes you may feel as if you're only making it more difficult for your spouse to see Jesus in you. Shh. But stay prayerful, respectful, and loving. God is not finished with them, with them yet. I, you can't, they can't see me. Ow, ow, ow. <laughs> uh. He has placed a witness to himself right in their bed next to them. <laughs> what, more, ah! what more could you want for your wife or husband than for them to experience the best that the life has to offer? The best that God, God uh, has oh. to offer. So yes, he encouraged and happy for any success your spouse enjoys. But save your heartiest congratulations for those times when they are taking a closer step to God and honoring Him as their first love. Today's Dare. Find, find a specific recent example when your spouse demonstrated Christian character in a noticeable way. Faith, love, honesty, patience, kindness, service, compassion, humility, and etc. Verbally commend them for this at some point today. 
What sample did you choose to recognize? How many other ways could you celebrate their growth and godliness? How could you encourage them to preserve it? And I said, David washed them with bottles for me so I didn't have to. I saw Uncle. I'm going to walk in it. That's, Some may say he post. should do this anyway, but it was an act of service and compassion for me, and sh and I greatly appreciated it. And I told him, and I told him so. Hi. Other ways I could celebrate him could be with a big smile, mm. hug, and kiss to show my appreciation. Please don't touch the camera. I know. And that's time to move. And to celebrate his growth in godliness. And I could mm -hmm. encourage him by immediately telling him and thanking him. Okay. Um, Bible verse that goes along with this is Psalm mm -hmm. 101 2. And it is mm -hmm. I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. Um, in your heart. In my heart. Here you have Oreos on your face, I just saw. Uh, okay, um, a uh, lady named Linda oh. said, Where would I have been without this book and the way God has moved through these dares each day? Okay, day 35. It is Love is a Cannibal, and it says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. That's Proverbs 15:22. Mighty sequoia trees, I guess that's how you say it, uh, tower hundreds of feet in the air and can withstand intense environmental pressures. Lightning can strike them, fierce winds can blow, and forest fires can rage around them. But the sequoia, sequoia, I don't, not, don't know really tree names, S-E-Q-U-O-I-A, endures standing firm, only growing stronger through the trials. One of the secrets to the strength of this giant tree is that it goes on below the surface. Okay. It's what goes on below the surface. Unlike many trees, they reach out and interlock the roots and the sequoias around them. Each become empowered and reinforced by the strength of others. The secret to sequoia is also a key to maintaining a strong, healthy relationship. A couple that faces problems alone is more likely to fall apart during tough times. However, the ones who interlock their lives in a network interlock, um, of other strong marriages radically increase their chances of surviving um, the storms. It, it is critical, or crucial, sorry, that husband and wife pursue godly advice, healthy relationships, and experienced mentors. Everyone needs wife counsel throughout life. Wise people constantly seek it and gladly receive it. Fools never ask for it and then ignore it when it is given to them. As the Bible so clearly explains, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Proverbs 12:15. Gaining wise counsels is like having a detailed road map and personal guide while traveling on a long, challenging journey. It can be the difference between a continual success or the destruction of another marriage. It is vital that you invite strong couples to share the wisdom they have gained through their own success and failures. And I said, my parents' church has a marriage course for engaged couples, and they arrange marriage mentors that you go to their house and go over a workbook with them. And, and then I said to check it out if your church has it, if you're engaged and we're doing this. Or if you know anybody who's engaged, you should tell them to check out. Um, sorry, I got hair. Stuck in my lip gloss. <laughs> Um, you should ask them to check out their local church to see if there's any, um, any like engagement classes. I think there's a name for it. I'm sorry, but the hair is like really getting my nerves. I think there's a name for it, but um, I can't re remember it right off the top of my head. 
Why waste years of your life learning painful lessons when you could discover those same truths during a few hours of wise counsel? Why not cross the bridges others have built? Wisdom is more valuable than gold. Not receiving it is like letting priceless coins pass through your fingers. And who wants to do that? I think that's the point that's trying to make in the book. Um, good marriage mentors warn you before you make a bad decision. They encourage you when you are ready to give up. And they cheer you on as you reach new levels of intimacy in your marriage. Do you have an older couple or friend of the same gender you can turn to for advice, for prayer support, and for regular accountability and checkups? Do you have someone in your life who shoots straight with you? And I said, I go to my mom, but I should probably also find someone also who isn't necessarily most likely always on my side. I think it's important to always find somebody who's not necessarily really close to you because I think they'll give you, not give you their like unbiased opinion because they want you to, they are going to say what they think you want to hear. And I think this is also like necessary when it comes to like therapy. Um, some people might think, um, that they have a lot of family or friends and like well, what can I go talk to them? Which is great. I think you should go talk to them, but also They know you and So like I said before kind of like if you're going to a parent to give you wise counsel They're gonna tell you what you want to wear uh, here. I mean sometimes they may not you might have one of those friends or parent or family member that's going to throw it out there and, and tell you how it really should be. But it's also good to have somebody who is not close to you to give you an outside opinion. Um, so that's what I think. Yeah, you think so too, Simba? Kitty kitty right here. Yeah. Hope what I just said made sense. Anyway. Okay. You must guard yourself against the wrong influencers. Everyone has an opinion, and some people will encourage you to act selfishly and leave your mate in order to pursue your own happiness. Be careful about listening to advice from people who don't have a good marriage themselves. That makes sense. If your marriage is hanging by a thread or already heading for divorce, then you need to stop everything and pursue solid counseling as quickly as possible. Call a pastor, a Bible-believing counselor, or a marriage ministry today. An awkward, as awkward as it may initially be to open up your life to a stranger, your marriage is worth every second spent and every sacrifice you will make for it. Even if your marriage is fairly stable, you're in no less need of honest, open mentors. People who can put wins in your cells and make your marriage even better. And I said, I had a psychologist and a psychiatrist before I, before, I had one before, <laughs> um, and I love them. I think everyone should have one. I do. I think everybody should go to some kind of therapist just to be able to open up and talk and free their minds and get some good godly counseling, counsel to it. Um, how do you pick a good mentor? You look for a person who has the kind of marriage you want. You look for a person whose heart for Christ comes first before anything else. You look for someone who doesn't live by his or her opinions, but by the unchanging word of God. And more times than not, this person will likely be delighted you ask them for help. Start praying for God to send this person into your life. Then pick up a time to meet and talk. If this doesn't sound too important to you, it would be a good idea to ask yourself why. Do you have something to hide? Are you afraid you will be embarrassed? Do you think your marriage is exempt from needing help, outside help? Does driving or does diving into a river of positive influence not appeal to you? Don't be captain of another titanic divorce by ignoring the warning signs around you when you could have been helped. Here's an important reminder from scripture. Each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Romans 14:12. This appointment is unbreakable. 
and though we're all ultimately responsible for the ways we approach it, we can surely stand as much help as others can give. It might just be relational influence that takes your marriage from mediocre to amazing. Okay, uh, today's there is find a marriage mentor, someone who is strong Christian who will be honest and loving with you. If you feel that counseling is needed, then take your first step to set up an appointment. During this process, ask God to direct your decisions and your discernment. And then it goes on to say, who did you choose? Why did you select this person? What do you hope to learn from them? And I said, I haven't done this yet, but I did have one from my parents' church before, and I really liked having the mentors, especially since they were older and wiser and could help with whatever questions I may have had. Um, That's something that David and I still need to do. Okay, a Bible verse that goes along with this is, In abundance of counselors, there is victory. That's Proverbs eleven fourteen. And then a lady named Sharon said, I said, nothing can fix what's already... I said, nothing can fix what's already this broken. But God has removed everything that was contaminating our marriage. Okay, day 36, and it is love is God's word. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalms 119, 105. The Bible is the most beloved and powerful book of all time. It was the first book ever published, is translated into more language than any other in history, and remains the bestseller of all the bestsellers. No book has enlightened so many darkness, educated so much ignorance, propagated so much love, re reprimanded so much evil, or predicted the future so accurately as the Bible. It not only explains our origins and purpose for life, but how we can know God here and in eternity beyond the grave. For some people, the Bible seems just too big to understand. They don't know where or how to begin. But as Christian, you're not left alone to try grasping the major themes and deep meanings of the Bible. The Holy Spirit, who now lives in your heart by the way of salvation, is an illuminator of truth. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God, 1 Corinthians 2.10. And because of his internal lamp, the scriptures are now yours to read, absorb, comprehend, and live by. But first, you've got to commit to do it. Be in it. If this is not already a habit of yours, now is the time to be reading a portion of the Bible every day. Ideally, read it together as husband and wife in the morning, perhaps, or before bed. Be like the writer of Psalms 119 who could say, With all my heart I have sought you, your word I have treasured in my heart, and I may not sin against you. So that is Psalms 119, 10-11. Those who practice a consistent pattern of reading the Bible soon discover to be, more, to be more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb, Psalms 19:10. Stay under it. Yes, the Bible can be deep and challenging. That's why it's so important to be part of the church where the word is faithfully taught and preached. By hearing it explained in sermons and Bible study groups, you'll, got, you'll get a broader, more balanced view of what God is saying through the word. You'll also get to join with others who are in the same journey you are, wanting to be fed by the truth of scripture. Continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you have learned them. 2 Timothy 3.14 Live it. Unlike most of the other books, which are only designed to be read and digested, the Bible is a living book. It lives because the Holy Spirit still re resonates within its words. It lives because, unlike the ancient writings of other religions, its author is still alive. And it lives because it becomes a part of who you are, how you think, and what you do. 
prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers. That is James 1.22. Jesus talked about people who build their lives on sand. They hear the truth of God's word, but they ignore it and go on their own way instead. When the storms of life begin to blow, foundations of sand will not only result in total disaster, their houses may light up and look nice for a while, but they are tragedies waiting upon them. Um, ultimately, they collapse. But Jesus said, Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. And that's Matthew 7, 24 through 25. When your home is founded on the rock of God's unchanging word, it is insured against destruction. That's because God has exactly the right plan for everything and he has revealed these, he's revealed these plans in his word. They're right there for you, for anyone who will simply read and apply them. God has a better plan for the way you handle your money, for example. A wiser plan for the way you raise your children. A healthier plan for the way you treat your body. A more productive plan for the way you spend your time. A more loving, peaceful plan for the way you handle conflict. And it isn't just like your maker to know exactly what you need. If, a, if being a regular Bible reader is new for you, you'll be surprised how quickly you begin thinking differently and more eternally once you start. That is so true. Um, I've experienced that for myself. And you're serious about establishing strategies for life based on God's way of doing things. He will guide you to make connections between what you're reading and how it applies. It is an enlightening journey with discoveries to be made all the time. In it, you will discover the secrets of handling wisely the issues of life. The more important truths of the love there was discovered by reading God's word. Every area of life that you submit to this guidance and wisdom will grow stronger and more long-lasting over time. By any facet you withhold from him, choosing instead to go your own way will weaken and eventually fail when the storms of life hit you. That one part may, in fact, be the one area that can ha hasten the downfall of your home and marriage. May God help you to trust in his word completely even when you don't fully understand it. It will not fail you. Wise couples build their house on the rock of God's word. They've seen what it can do. They know how it feels when their footing gets soft and the foundation gives away. That's why you must determine to build your life and marriage on the solid rock of the Bible. And then you can plan on stronger future, no matter how the, bad the storm gets. Today's dare is commit to reading the Bible every day. Find a devotional book or other resource that will give you some guidance. If your spouse is open to it, see if they will commit to daily Bible reading with you. Begin submitting each area of your life to its guidance and start building on the rock. What parts of your life are the greatest need of God's counsel? What, where do you feel the most susceptible to failure? What are you asking God to show you through His Word? And I said... I believe being a, be a mother and wife are the parts of my life that are the greatest need to God in God's counsel. That and how hard, uh, how hard I am on myself. I feel the most accessible to fa failure when it comes to my housework. I ask God to show me through his word how to be a good mom and wife and he showed me Proverbs 31. Now I ask him how I can be more like her. Okay, whatever has written in earlier times was written for the instruction, for our instruction, Romans 15, 4. Okay, and then there it says, um, for a way to familiar size with the Bible, we're going to go to the appendix of page 227. 
All right, and it goes on to say, The Word of God in my life. Let this proclamation help you to rightly approach the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. It is holy, inerrant, infallible, and completely authoritative. Proverbs 35 through 6, John 17, 17, and Psalms 119, 89. It is profitable for teaching, reproving, and correcting, and training me in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3, 3, 16. It matures and equips me to be ready for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 17. He is a lamp to my feet in life and a light to my path. Psalms 119, 105. It makes me wiser than my enemies. Psalms 119, 97 through 100. It brings me stability during the storms of my life. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. If I believe it's truth, I will be set free. John 8, 32. If I hide it in my heart, I'll be protected in times of temptation. Psalms 119, 11. If I continue in it, it will become a true disciple. John 8, 31. If I might meditate on it, it will become successful. Joshua 1, 8. If I kept it, I will be rewarded and love per perfected. Psalms 119, 7 through 11, and 1 John 2, 5. It is living, powerful, discerning God, word of God. Hebrews 4, 12. It is the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 17. It is sweeter than honey and more desirable than gold. Psalms 19, 10. It is indestructible and forever settled in heaven. 2 Corinthians 13, 7 through 8 in Psalms 119.89. It's absolutely true with no mixture of error. error John 17.17 17 and Titus 1.2. It is absolutely true about God. Romans 3 through 4, 16, 25, 27, Colossians 1. It's absolutely true about man. Jeremiah 17.9, Psalms 8, 4 through 3. It is absolutely true about sins. Romans 3.23 It is absolutely true about salvation. Acts 4.12 Romans 10.9 It is absolutely true about heaven and hell. Revelations 21.8 Psalms 119.89 Lord, open my eyes that I may see truth and my ears to hear truth. Open my heart to receive it by faith. Renew my mind to keep it in hope. Surrender my will that I may live it with love. Remind me that I am responsible when I hear it. Help me desire to obey what you say through it. Transform my life that I may know it. Burden my heart that I may share it. Speak now, Lord. Give me passion in to know and follow your will. Sh nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Okay, so that is the last part of what I'm doing today. I have the Love Dare Challenge by Stephen and Alex Kendrick. And I will have more soon. But if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe and hit that bell so you never miss any of our videos. Alright, until next time. Bye.